All right. Hi. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's Artist United broadcast, The Artist as a Healthy Being. I'm Sam Hall, a founding board member of Artist United. I'm also an artist, a theater director, and a professor of theater for 20 years. I know I have certainly felt the extra strain from this past year of trying to stay healthy and physically and emotionally um, and I'm confident that so many of you have felt the same way. So that's what we are going to talk about tonight, an artist, physical and mental health and the access to healthcare. So who are we? Artists United is an international arts advocacy organization that creates a place, a way for artists to connect, to ask for help and to offer help with coaching, collaboration and mentoring. We help artists work in reciprocity which minimizes how much recreating of the wheel we find ourselves doing across any aspect of art creation or art business. Freeing up time, energy, and capacity by freeing up this bandwidth, artists can infuse their work with an even deeper creativity. One way we offer help to artists is through producing content like this broadcast today. We bring together powerful thought leaders in the topic of the day and get to hear their wisdom and insights. Hopefully this content proves helpful in your life, art, neighborhoods, and communities, and you feel your support for your creativity, productivity, health, and vitality. For today's broadcast, I am joined by the board chair for Artists United, Jennifer Wallace, and I'm going to bring her in now as my co-host to introduce you to everyone else. Great. Thank you, Sam. So I got involved with Artists United because I am a storyteller at heart. Uh, I'm most at home in my body when I'm writing. Uh, I'm also a competitively trained ballroom dancer and I did some ballet as well. And um, most recently I've turned my creative attentions to filmmaking for the past four or five years uh, with a few films in production and producing for other people. Um, and tonight we have an incredible, incredible group of specialists joining us. Um, they have extensive personal and professional experience and the list of leadership accolades amongst this group is a mile long. I am so humbled and so grateful to be here in conversation with these leaders tonight. Um, we, have Mark, we have Dr. Mark Diaz, who's chair of the National Hispanic Medical Foundation. We have Jenny Morton. We have Dr. Margarita Loeza. We have Dr. Eric Griggs and Dr. Ed Ramirez, and we're going to turn to them in a moment and they're going to tell you more about themselves and their work in the communities. Um, but first, I want to bring in Dr. Diaz and bring him into the conversation here. And so, Dr. Diaz, I would love it if you would tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, your background and also the National Hispanic Medical Foundation. And then if you want to launch us into our first question in tonight's conversation, you're welcome to do that, too. Oh, you're on mute. Nope. I'm still on mute. Kate, can you unmute him? We, we can hear you now, Dr. Diaz. You can? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a family medicine trained physician who's also board certified in occupational medicine. I practiced occupational medicine for over 20 years and taught part time in the University of California Davis in the Department of Family and Community Medicine for more than 30 years. I'm currently a consultant for the medical, uh, a medical consultant for the state of California public employees retirement system and their disability retirement section. For this particular event, I'm a member of the National Hispanic Medical Association and I serve as chairman of the National Hispanic Health Foundation. The National Hispanic Medical Association is a nonprofit association representing 50,000 licensed Hispanic physicians in the US whose mission is to empower the Hispanic physicians and other healthcare professionals to improve the health of Hispanic populations with medical societies, resident and medical student organizations, and public and private sector partners. And so this is one of our partnership type events here. Um, and with that, I'll ask the other uh, participants to introduce themselves, um, starting with, uh, let's see, 
Who's next? Uh, how about Jenny? Hi, everybody. I'm Jenny Morton, and I'm an osteopath, um, and I have a master's in psychology, so I work in sort of behavioral medicine, behavioral health, uh, but I specialize in performing arts medicine, so that's kind of like the sports medicine, but for the artists. Um, my professional career before that was as a classical ballet dancer, then a musical theatre uh, performer in the West End in London, and uh, then I was the lead singer of a big band for 10 years, and also did a lot of film and TV acting as well. So I kind of been there and done it in the arts, and knew all the things and all the challenges that the artists face, not only just in their own physicality, but in the environment that they're working in. So in performing arts medicine, we're going to take all those things into consideration when you're coming in with your back pain. We're going to look at well, what was the repertoire you were doing? What was the, uh, you know, theatre environment, performance environment you were working in, as well as looking at your specifics in the body. So I really enjoy the fact that I can combine all my knowledge of being in, in the, the arts profession myself with the healthcare uh, aspect and make sure that we're taking care of all aspects of, of performers. So that's what I do. Well, thank you very much. And uh, how about Dr. Ramirez? Hi, good evening. My name is Ed Ramirez and I am otolaryngologist. That means an ear, nose and throat doctor, and, uh, retired from UCLA faculty, um, treated many uh, professional voice users. In addition, I am a guitarist, vocalist and composer and so I'm very much in tune with the needs and really the limitations and the health issues that come with vocal performance and vocal arts. Um, and I'm just happy to be here. And uh, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. All right, how about Dr. Loiza? Hi, I'm Margarita Loiza. I'm a family medicine doctor at the Venice Family Clinic. It's a federally qualified health center for um, uninsured and under underinsured people in West Los Angeles. And Dr. Griggs. Hello, my name is uh, Eric Griggs. I am a community medicine doctor. I'm the director of community medicine for Access Health Louisiana here in in uh, Louisiana in New Orleans, and we have. Uh, 36 clinics, 47,000 patients. I'm responsible for everything outside of the, uh, the, the office. I am the health educator for the Fox 8 affiliate here in Louisiana. I fell into this space. Uh, I've been doing this about eight to 10 years, was a radio host, uh, and I played classical violin for 27 years, and I was talking to Dr. Morton about treating a trigger thumb. That I have a doctor, we need the artists, we need, need to unite. Um, when I grew up, I wanted to be Spider-Man. My mom was a radio host and a TV host, and I thought that would be the last thing that I would ever do because I had stage fright and uh, social anxiety, but I've been doing television and radio for the last 10 years. That's excellent. Great. Um, I think we'll go ahead and go on to the questions at this time. And first question will go to Dr. Morton. How does creativity relate to the whole body health? So, yeah, I mean, this is uh, an area that really intrigued me, having been a performer for so many years. You know, is there a biological basis for creativity? There's this question of nature versus nurture, right? Are you born creative? Is it innate or does it develop? And so I kind of took a dive into all the research on that. And, you know, pretty much the answer is it's a combination of the two. But some really interesting things popped out that that just when I share them with artists, they always go, oh, you just explain me. Um, so one of those features is that there, there was a study out of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, Sweden, which is a big research center. And they were looking at differences in brain anatomy that can predict creativity. Um, so this would definitely fall into that kind of nature bucket. And what they showed in their study was that there are structural differences in brain anatomy that can predict creativity. And the way they kind of defined creativity, if you like, was um, the capacity for divergent 
thought. So this is the ability to kind of think outside the box and, and look at things from a different angle, a different perspective. And, you know, that's what art is, right? We take what's in society, look at it a different way and shine it back to the audience and say, hey, look at it this way. And this is, you know, a major role that art plays. Um, and divergent thought also allows you to hold many different streams of thought at once, right? So you're sort of thinking about this and then, oh, and that, and oh, whereas the opposite is con convergent thought where you can just focus on one thing. And a lot of artists kind of get the reputation of being like very distracted or, you know, oh, we've got a million things, you know, they're never following one train of thought. And that's actually a part of the creative process. And so what this study was looking at was a particular area of the brain called the thalamus. There's no quiz at the end. You don't have to remember that, but in case you're interested. But the, one of the roles of the thalamus is it acts as a filter for some of the environmental signals that are out in the world. So we're being bombarded all the time by visual information, sounds, smells, temperature change. And we need to be able to kind of filter that down so that, you know, say we're walking in a really busy street with a lot of traffic and people and noise. You need to be able to put one foot in front of the other and not be overwhelmed by all this, this kind of environmental signals coming in. So the thalamus kind of acts to filter that down so we can focus on one thing. And to do that, it needs something called dopamine. And you might have heard of that. That's like a chemical in the body that most people know as the kind of happy chemical, right? It, it's our reward chemical, our pleasure signal, but it has lots of other jobs as well. And this is one of them. And so what they looked at was on the surface of this thalamus, this filter in the brain, it has little receptors for dopamine because it needs dopamine to, to operate this filtration mechanism. And what they showed was people who are more up that divergent end of the scale, the creative people, have fewer receptors for dopamine on their thalamus. So I always say in layman's terms, it means we're less able to filter the crazy, right? Everything comes in and we're like, oh, this and that. No, I've seen that. And oh, there's just all this kind of noise. But it can be a very noisy place to live, right? If you've been on stage and you've been hyper stimulated by all the energy of, of the performance space and then you come off and everyone's in your face backstage and it's all buzzing and you're like, I just, I just need my world to go quiet. We need that thalamus to kick in. But if we don't have uh, enough receptors on the surface of that thalamus to absorb that chemical we need for that filtration, we're kind of left in this noisy place. And this can also predict uh, addictive tendencies. So we do know that statistically there's, there are more addictive behaviors within the sort of creative arts population than general population. And essentially, if addiction to anything, be it alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, exercise doesn't even have to be something destructive, just that addictive tendency is essentially a craving for dopamine. You're not, you're not addicted to alcohol, you're addicted to the dopamine your body releases in response to taking that in, same with drugs. So when we are in this kind of overstimulated state, we're essentially dopamine hungry. So if we can't access it within our own bodies, we tend to look for it outside ourselves, right? So we look for that glass of wine or bar of chocolate, whatever it is to help us just narrow our world. So that can sort of explain some of these connections uh, between uh, creative ability and the fact that that can be a, quite a noisy place to live. So it will affect our mental health. And what they also showed in this study is that that same brain anatomy, that deficiency of those receptors for dopamine is shared by people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So you can almost think of this as a sort of spectrum that creativity is on that also includes some of those more serious mental health challenges. So um, I always say it's not, a you know, people say, oh, you're these crazy artists. It's like, no, we're just creative. And that's just the way our brain anatomy is, is designed. You can't have one without the other. So, so can I ask a question on that then? Sure. Um, so would that be why 
more successful artists are the artists that can then create a pattern for themselves. So they know how to let themselves have the freedom, but then how to bring themselves back down to reality, to the real world, and then tomorrow get up and, and process that. Yeah, it, it, it's very much about knowing this stuff allows you to preempt it, right? And to actually put strategies in place. If you just let your body run, you're often going to be, you know, feel like you're a passenger on that journey. So you have to work to build strategies to preempt those situations and yeah, have, you know, even, you know, that I work with quite a few prominent artists and, you know, they have a team around them. So it's like, when I come off stage, make sure I've got this and this, and you keep these people away and you sort of manage your environment so that you preempt that tendency and you look for, you know, forms of exogenous dopamine that are not destructive as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's all about, awareness I always say with artists you know once you're aware of this stuff you can actually build the strategies in to uh, address it but the issue is we don't we don't put this into training you know most artists are not aware aware of this you're not sort of you know if you're signed with a record label they're not going to be taking care of that for you either if you were in the sports world you'd have your sports psych team your whole team that would get all that stuff in place in the arts we're kind of sent into the profession um uh, without any kind of uh life jacket if you like and we're just supposed to swim and and in a very volatile environment so yeah it's very much about building strategies and preempting and understanding those uh tendencies yeah and so making that part of your your business of being an artist is knowing how what you're you how you work this way and how you um, manifest so that'd be part of the business side of artistry versus the performance necessarily yeah absolutely and i, I think you know physical and mental health with artists is not, they don't see it in the same way, say a sports person would, you know, it's fundamental to being an athlete, right? That you take care of those things. But in the arts, we tend to sort of leave those and we only look at it if something goes wrong, right? And then we try and retro <laughs> manage uh, the situation rather than looking ahead. And, you know, I like to work with artists before they're going on tour, for example, pre-tour preparation, you're touring, you haven't got your connection to your social group or your, um, you know, usual forms of food and, you know, nutrition's a big part of, of behavior as well, because food is mood. And so being able to build yourself strategies so that you're not then drawn into um, destructive behaviors because you're not feeling, you know, calibrated and on a level surface uh, when you're out of your gen normal routine. So routine is so important to artists because we're often out of that, you know, we're in this venue one night, this venue another night. Um, so having your personal routine is absolutely key to regulating um, the, the, the brain chemistry because there's other studies that have also shown a link between dopamine dysregulation and creativity. So most people have a sort of a, a slight sort of lilting fluctuation of dop dopamine release, but artists tend to have peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs. So again, if you can, you can manage, learn strategies to help manage that situation. Um, it's all about preparation and, uh, and it's something that really needs to be um, pushed as a sort of responsibility for artists to really uh, look ahead and take care of that, but they need some guidance. Yeah. Can I jump in and ask another question? Um, mm. Actually, I have two quick questions. One is about the the effects of trauma, either generational trauma or sustained trauma on the brain and creativity. And then the second one is about the connection between creativity and physical health. And that that can take us into the conversation with the rest of our crew here too. Thanks. Yeah, and that that uh, those two things kind of bleed into each other. Um, so trauma uh, in childhood, so childhood adversity, as we refer to it, again has been linked in in the literature to creativity and that it can actually be one of the things that facilitates a more creative personality um, and we're not necessarily here talking about the sort of what we call the big t trauma you know where there's there's really sort of frank abuse um, it can be anything just uh, 
where you don't feel safe. I always say, in, in, you know, if you boil the body down to very, very, very simplistic principles, we're either running the safe program or the unsafe program. And unsafe can just be, you know, I was brought up in a family of artists. They were all volatile, right? So you're always like, oh, oh, oh is she in a good mood or a bad mood? Or, oh, you know, so you're never quite sure where you are. You're always in this sort of state of flux, which from the body's perspective is unsafe. When you're in un the unsafe mode, you tend to your energy resources, your battery life, as I refer to it in the body, is diverted to defense behavior, right? The immune system is part of that, but we never really think of the immune system as being emotional. So our emotional uh, state drives the immune system, right? So if we are emotionally unsafe, we're going to divert re resources to the immune system. But also, if you are in a situation where you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel safe, and life is not feeling very tolerable uh, in your day to day, children tend to retreat inwards and create the world they want to live in in their own head, right? So children have that ability anyway, this sort of imagination, the, the, uh, the sort of deeper portals where they can go and be creative. So if 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 what if your situation is is not um, ideal that you're living in, you can go and create that world within yourself, and therefore you sort of tend to retain this creativity because it's become an, a form of escapism for you. And for so many artists, being with their instrument, being you know uh, dancing, whatever it is, is a form of escapism. It takes them away from the the mundane and the um, you know, the things that are not so comfortable in life. So there we can see that correlation between um, adversity in childhood and, and creativity. But to pull that into uh, kind of whole body health, you know, coming back to that, that idea that if we are living in a state of defense all the time, when we're in defense mode, the unsafe mode, none of the normal uh, processes of growth, repair and maintenance are going on in the body. They only happen when we're in safe mode. So if you are growing as a child, that's that can be a big issue because you haven't got in, in, enough of the energy availability being diverted to that. If you're, um, you know, an, a, a a fully grown uh, musician, dancer or whatever, and you're getting little injuries and niggles as you're performing, your repair rate is not gonna be as good if you're in defense mode all the time. And from a behavioral perspective, again, if you don't feel safe in your childhood environment, you have to start managing the behaviors, right? Oh, I mustn't, I must keep quiet, otherwise I'm gonna trigger this person, right? So you start to repress your own voice if you like and what what you should be doing is going no this is inappropriate anger is an external expression of defense but it's also an inflammatory response so we produce inflammatory chemicals and and put them out into the world as a defense response if it's not safe for you to do that you're going to tend to turn that inwards and it becomes resentment. So anger versus resentment. Resentment is an internalization of that inflammatory response and all the inflammatory chemicals that should be diverted towards your external defenses are kind of left latent in the system and can sort of go around and start causing trouble within your own body, go and hang out in your joints, in different body tissues. And this can be um, the basis of an autoimmune condition. So an autoimmune condition is um, when your body's defense system is, is turning on you rather than outside. So when we look at emotional behaviors, they are often mirrored in the physiology and in, in, in the expression of, of health. So un skewed emotional boundaries that come from insecurity can lead to insecure immo immune system boundaries that we're not sure what's self and what's not self and we can start to see uh, inflammatory processes uh, occurring in the body. Thank you very much and moving on to physical health issues that affect artists we'll have Dr. Ramirez uh, speak to that those issues. Sure thank you. Jenny, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation. It uh, hits back to the right brain, left brain. 
and um, I can really uh, re relate to a lot of what you're saying. As a surgeon, um, I realized very early I received my mother's hands. She used to knit and do macrame and she would paint. And I thought, wow, what a gift I got from my mother. Um, and then I learned to play the guitar. And anyway, uh, family and our environment are so key in the development of our, uh, of our art. But as a uh, otolaryngologist, just to talk about the physical aspects in terms of the ear, nose, and throat, and what I've seen throughout my career, 30 years of treating patients, especially professional voice users, um, there can be many conditions that are, you know, like you say, there can be preventative health, or there can be instances when patients come in when it's a little too late. But basically, general caveats in terms of taking care of the professional voice user would be uh, vocal exercises when you're not in a live performance, but you know, warming up, having a voice coach. Um, and then there's some obvious do's and don'ts. And um, as you're well aware, Jenny, uh, we don't recommend any citrus or dairy products before a singing or vocal performance. Um, a lot that, you know, my son is a professional voice user. He's in a band and he's signed and, you know, they go out and do their concerts pre-COVID. They go out and do their concerts and they're playing till, you know, midnight, one in the morning. And then they need to have something to eat. And then they usually have drinks to follow, all of which sets them up to have reflux or what we call laryngopharyngeal reflux or gastroesophageal reflux that can lead to chronic dysphonia or hoarseness. Um, and I've seen many of patients that come in and they have contact granulomas and I'll ask them about their performances, their singing, their routine after the performance, as you're well aware. Um, and they all come in with very much a very similar story. You know, I go eat after, or I go have a couple of drinks with my friends, it's two, three in the morning, they're going to sleep with a full stomach that has alcohol in it all of which can relax the esophagus and gastroesophageal sphincter, we call it, and allow alcohol and acid to coat the vocal cords. And that can lead to really serious complications in terms of vocal cord performance and health. Um, there's also problems with overuse and misuse that I see. Uh, people are talking on the phone a lot. Uh, they're talking on Zoom. Um, and so, instead of doing their normal routine exercise and being out and about, they're overusing their vocal cords. Once again, that can lead to contact granulomas or true vocal cord nodules or singer's nodules. Um, in Los Angeles, it, you know, we have the Santa Ana winds and we have allergies. So people get seasonal allergies and they often will take an antihistamine with that. And that leads to dryness. And the vocal cords are very sensitive to humidification or a lack thereof. Um, as you see me here, I'm drinking decaffeinated warm tea so that my voice doesn't get strained and it stays hydrated. But the things that we do recommend um, is that we do drink warm fluids that are decaffeinated. Uh, we don't want caffeinated beverages because those are actually a diuretic that could lead to dryness, that could lead to increased dysphonia or hoarseness. Um, these are the things that I see in um, performers. And then we talk about vocal range and pitch. Um, and I'll ask, what do you do during a performance when you're getting phonatory breaks or breaks in your vocal uh, maneuvers? And a lot of time they'll push it and I'll say, look, you gotta just drop down an octave to prevent any micro injury to your vocal cords, which could lead to hematomas and nodules. Um, in terms of the ear and otologic uh, processes that I see is, you know, you talked about being in a band. Um, if you don't have in-ear monitors um, that are adequate uh, and you can't hear yourself on stage, you end up abusing your voice, um, and you end up turning up the volume louder if you have a monitor on the floor. And eventually that can lead to 
sensory or hearing loss, and then chronic tinnitus as a result. So I see a lot of professional stage people that are either theater or musicians that come in. They're in their mid forties to beyond. And they're telling me I have this ringing in my ears. What can I do about it? We order a hearing test and then nine times out of 10, it's from high frequency sensory or hearing loss as a result of chronic loud noise exposure. So I do recommend uh, molded hearing plugs, uh, musicians earplugs, if you are gonna be on stage uh, that, that can dampen the sound so that you aren't exposed to chronic loud noise. And basically that's what I see from a voice and from an otologic or ear process. Thank you, that's great. Sure. And uh, next we'll hear from Dr. Loeza to discuss healthcare delivery systems and access to care for the people that she sees in her community. Hi everyone. Um, so access to care is really hard right now during the pandemic. I'm sure that a lot of people have tried to get a doctor's appointment and or get seen in the emergency room. I think um, that we need to, for different patients, there's different types of insurance and unfortunately your insurance drives where you get to go. So um, we're a safety net clinic. We're a federally qualified health center at Venice Family Clinic. So we can't turn anyone away and we don't want to. And we have sliding fees or we help people enroll in different insurance plans. But um, I think for people who, um, who can't get um, healthcare in the traditional way through private insurance should seek out federally qualified health centers so that they can you know, do the, the basic preventative care, like checking your weight, your blood pressure, your blood work, you know, immunizations, cancer screening, and um, also to kind of learn how to use the system in that during a pandemic, try to use telemedicine. So um, even though at first it might seem odd to do everything on Zoom or to do things by the phone, it's something that, um, you can try to start with at least some of the initial stuff or some of the complaints or concerns on the phone or by video. And then that way, when you come in and see your doctor in person, it doesn't have, you don't have to spend a long time in the clinic because you've already covered some of the ground on the phone or video. It's just different ways to look at the healthcare system now since um, during COVID, um, you don't want to sit in a waiting room for hours while someone else has COVID and then everyone in that waiting room gets COVID. So the important type thing right now is to um, keep in touch with your doctor. There's a lot of things that you can do via telemedicine or telehealth. You can, you know, they can schedule a mammogram for you on the phone. They can send you a colon cancer screening kit. It. Um, and then when you do come in, you do something quick. You can come in and get lab works and, and labs done and talk about them on the phone um, later. But I think the important thing is to at least stay in contact at least once a year or, you know, check in. And I know a lot of people have been um, deferring a lot of things all of 2020 because they're afraid to go in. So, um, you know, try telemedicine first and try federally qualified health centers to make sure you stay connected and get some, you know, primary care. Is there a way for people to find out the list of what are those federally qualified medical clinics? How would they do that? You know, it, it's as simple as, as Googling federally qualified health center near me, you know, or um, going on, you know, the looking for, you know, who gives health care in your area. And um, it, you know, I, I realize we're gonna we're talking to a lot of people in different areas, but it's there. You know, federally qualified health centers have been around for 50 years. Also, different county hospitals. So, um, you know, and you know, it's as simple as calling them and asking them if if they will take you, and if not, they usually end up referring you to someone in the area or someone near you, based on your insurance, based on. Um, your demographic. So they take a little information and then they decide where you can be seen. Got it. I got a question. Is there, um, like I just had to do my first tele doctor appointment for trigger thumb, which I got the shot for, just going to say. Um, but I hate it uh -huh. because I'm, I'm a 
person to person communicator. And as Jenny was talking about, like my anxiety goes up when I'm like trying to explain something on the computer to somebody. I was like, I sound like a hypochondriac because they ask me one question. Well, of course that hurts and this hurts and this hurts. Well, when I'm in person with the doctor, I don't have that anxiety. So my anxiety just keeps me talking and things go kind of crazy. Um, in Artemis, we were dealing with a situation this week with a, a, a woman who couldn't telecommunicate. And I told her my problems I had, and we actually had her not do the video and just listen. And her appointment went much better. Is that an option for people who don't have necessarily a computer that they can call in at least if they can't video in? Of course, we we um, we do a lot of telephone visits with, uh, um, you know, a lot of the patients that I see are, you know, older or don't have internet access, don't have a computer, or they're just taking like 10 or 15 minutes during their break to talk to me on the phone. And I, I totally understand what you mean, because, you know, I've been doing telemedicine for a year and um, I've had people tell me like, well, what are we going to do? Tell me what to do. And I'm like, close your eyes pretend you're in an exam room with me and we're just sitting, we're just talking, tell me how you feel. And it just, you know, it's just like doing anything on Zoom. It just seems weird. Like it, it's um, uncomfortable. And obviously this is, you know, not the gold standard, you know, but it's a way to keep people safe and to kind of like start kind of deciding who needs to come in and who doesn't. And so instead of having 20 people waiting in the waiting room, maybe we'll have a couple. So it's, it's I most of what doctors get is the history. I'm sure the other doctors will get is that probably you get 90% of the information you need or maybe even 95 from the story that they tell you mm-hmm. and not necessarily the physical exam, but it's really the story and the, and uh, you know other nonverbal cues and other physical exams are important too, but it's really the story. And we'll get used to it and get better at it. But you know, if if the doctor doesn't get a good feeling or needs more, of course they're going to make you come in. But you know, yeah. it's a good yeah. And I think that's the important thing. It's like you can get past it. They kept asking me, "What? How does it feel?" Well, it hurts right here. You know, and they can't see that. They can't like look at the bump. You know, I'm trying to show them. Um, and they did then have me come in and they're like, oh, this is a problem. And so I think that's the other thing is that um, people can get through that if it's uncomfortable and finally get to the visit. But that just the precautions at this time warrant that. And that kind of is the new norm going forward, don't you think? I think it will be the new normal. And I have been amazed in how many things I have been able to diagnose over video and phone. And then I've been amazed at some things that I absolutely need to see. So it's been like a learning with the patients over time. And a lot of the patients are really happy because, you know, they have to get on the bus for like an hour and a half to get there, or they have to pay, you know, they have to leave work, get time off of work. You know, they have to leave their kids alone. I mean, their kids are all doing Zoom classroom. I can't tell them come to the clinic and wait in the waiting room for an hour and a half and leave your kids unattended, you know? So there's, there's trade-offs and it's really, really difficult. And I know that we all became doctors because we like to be with people and we want to be around others. (laughs) Um, So it's, it's not easy for us either. You know, I miss seeing my patients, but I also don't want my patients to get COVID because I've already lost a lot of patients from COVID. So I'm just saying, you know, we, we've gone this far, we're going to get our vaccines, things will be better soon. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. we're, we're inching along, we're, you know. Dr. Loiza, would you um, be willing to share your story of what, what brought you into medicine and where you're working now and your connection to it? Sure, sure. Um, I'm, I'm a daughter of Mexican immigrants and my, I was born in Santa Monica and I was, um, um, I was born breech, like feet first. And so I had, um, you know, congenital hip displacement. So I was, since I can remember as a little kid, I was always at the orthopedic surgeon or, you know, just in and out, always getting surgeries, braces, casts, um, you name it. I think by the time I was 15, I had four surgeries or, you know, I knew all the physical therapy. I know all the words for different medical terms. And when it was time to get like my vaccines and like regular medical care, um, they referred us from St. John's Hospital to the Venice Family Clinic. And um, the Venice Family Clinic used to be a clinic that was at a dental office and um, volunteer doctors would see patients at night and they would take a number and they would just see like, you know, a couple patients. And so I was one of the patients and then I, um, kind of after that, 
after you know being around all these doctors all my life, I wanted to be a doctor. And so I went to med school and all that stuff. And then when I came back, I started working at the Venice Family Clinic and I've been working there for like 20 years. Beautiful. Um, I read a quote you had said about, um, I thought it was so, so beautifully said and, and sad, but when you go somewhere and nobody looks like you, it's a way of saying you don't belong without saying it. And I wanted to change that as far as being in medicine. And um, yeah, that's, that's true. I don't remember ever seeing a Latina doctor until I was in medical school, I think like second or third year. It was Dr. Rios, who's part of NHMA. <laughs> it was probably the first Latina doctor I ever met. Wow, well done. Go Great. ahead, Diaz. That's wonderful. Uh, and speaking about community issues and community health care, is Dr. Griggs. Hello, hello, and hello. Uh, yeah, the, the thing that I tell my students, uh, I work with public health students, undergrad students, med students, people that aren't students, anybody that will listen, I tell them that community medicine is three Ps. It's people, it's practice, and it's policy. And all of the maladies that we suffer in the community, for every malady we suffer, the answer to all of the maladies come from the community if we take the time to listen. Um, we're in unique times. Uh, we talk about COVID-19, taking the, ripping the Band-Aid off of what was wrong with the broken system and exposing it. Well, not only that, it pulled the curtain back on the whole scientific process. Uh, and the funny thing is, it revealed a lot about human nature and about who we, who we are. Uh, we spent a lot of time and a lot of energy uh, uh, going and saying that I wanna be a doctor and we are supported by the community. Uh, our grandmothers, our teachers, our, our uncles, our, even our friends, look, you need to go home and study. Uh, I'm sure we all heard that. Um, and they start introducing you as that. And we take all this time, we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for it. We go away and we learn all these big words and these theories and these huge things. And we come back and we talk to the community uh, in a language that they don't understand. Uh, it's called health literacy. Uh, as, as performing artists and as artists, as, as, as creative minds, we love uh, taking what we, the world and the way we perceive it and putting it on, on display for everyone, everyone to see, and we love explaining it. Now, if, if we as scientists would take that same approach and take the time to talk to the community in ways that they understand, um, because think about it, as, as doctors, as healthcare, healthcare providers, when you walk into a room or when you're giving a lecture, everyone does this. Yes, you have hypercholesterolemia, hyperlipidemia, syndrome X, and hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and peripheral vascular disease is probably genetic. Um, and you run the risk of having a cardiovascular accident or a small one, which might be a transient ischemic event. Do you understand what I'm saying? And everyone goes, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did he say? I don't know. I, Doc, am I going to die? No. But he said, I'm not going to die. So I'm good. It's fine. <laughs> we turn our backs on the very people that created who we are. I'll tell a quick story. Uh, my first year of uh, residency, uh, my first night in July in the U.S., we, you fin graduate from med school in May, June. You begin uh, your life as a doctor, uh, even though the only thing that's changed is time. Uh, in July, on July 1st, well, on my first night on call was like July 3rd. Uh, I happened to be in the ICU, and uh, they uh, they said that my patient had was uh, running a code. Uh, everyone runs to the room, and I'm like, man, look, I, I don't know. Uh, there must be a code. I'm waiting on the doctor to run into the room, and everyone's waiting on me. <laughs> now, I ran what's called a, uh, it's, it's called a code blue, and typically your code blues, uh, you know, there's a certain time limit to the because it gets past a certain point of circulation that you have to let it go. Uh, <laughs> I ran a 37 minute code because I would not quit. Uh, I didn't realize, well, I did realize, I just, I had just been talking to this patient. Uh, they, they, they had a, what's called a pulmonary embolism, a PE, uh, and they expired, I ran a 37 minute code. Uh, all of my, you know, the attending came and everyone talked to me. The person that comforted me and let me know that not to quit was the same person that loved me first, uh, besides my mom, it was my grandmother. Baby, I don't know 
what it is, but there's some things you can control and some things you can't. Every time that I want to give up, it hasn't been those big long words or any of those those papers, those white papers that we like to write and see our name and go, oh, da, da. It, it's been the community. Uh, on days uh, when COVID-19 first hit uh, here, uh, I'll never forget March 13th. Uh, typically was doing two, two segments a week and now I've been doing segments. I've done over 300 to 400 TV segments on COVID-19 uh, every day. And there's been days that I wanted to quit. Uh, you put your emotions to the side um, and you just power through it, but then we're human. And the dopamine and the, the endorphins, the serotonin, the oxytocin, all those things, the oxytocin is the love hormone. It's the connection uh, hormone. Uh, it gets low when you're isolated, you're told to go in the house. It's been the community that's wrapped its arms around me because they see me giving myself to the community. My job has been, and our jobs as healthcare providers, the whole reason we went into this is to give every gift that we have away. And what you find, what I find is that the more you give the community, they give back to you 1,000 fold. Doc, are you okay? There was a time I was embarrassed to try to go buy anything to eat because they wouldn't let me pay for anything. Because <laughs> I took the time to explain things to them. We are a community and if COVID-19, if there is never, and this is never in my lifetime did, would, did I ever think that we would have one thing that would unite us have us on our knees together and unite us in spite of any other efforts, um, a disease that has done that. I mean, we are people helping people. We read a bunch of books. We work really hard to help folks. And believe it or not, I really uh, believe it's, it's, it's appreciated. The, the education and hearing people use your words, wear your mask. Why? Because it's not that you have to wear two masks. It's about the better fit. And the less you're able to breathe out a filter through your mask, the less respiratory droplets there are to pass on to other people. And you're hearing this from people that don't know you, you've never met, and they might have an, a literacy of, of, of a reading literacy and comprehension literacy of three, four, five years old and be 60, 70 years old. They might have a health literacy of first or second grade because they didn't go to med school. So the more we give away, uh, and and, and um, there have been studies that show the more the more you take the time to educate and spend time with people, be the social creatures that we are, and and exercise your altruism, the healthier the community. And believe it or not, the more the community will make sure that you're healthy uh, moving forward. Can I? I'm gonna I'm gonna invert that now. You're talking about um, you know the the work you're doing to go out to the community. Um, that accountability that you have and responsibility to offering your gifts. Um, in your work, Dr. Greg, as you talk about empowering the community about being experts on their own health and health outcomes, um, how do you encourage the community and the individual to take the accountability and the responsibility for themselves for their own health care and health, health outcomes? So, so again, I, I mentioned that uh, I, earlier before, Prior to going on in introductions, I wear a lot of hats, just not a lot of hair. Um, prior to all of this, when I had a lot of hair, prior to COVID-19, my platform was get checked, get fit, get moving. Uh, and when I was in med school uh, back in the early 90s, early to mid 90s, uh, the system changed. I went into med school to spend time with people and the system changed and it, it, it really got narrowed down to where you had like 10 to 15 minutes with each patient. Um, you can't empower someone to be an expert on their own health in that time. So you have to go outside of the office. And so what I do is I do events, people policy and practice. You have to spend time with people. You have to teach them how to practice so the policies can be, be congruous with what they're, you're asking them to do. Simple tasks, get checked, get fit, get moving. Um, telling people that go to the doctor once a year. If you're a, if whatever sport you're a fan of, Get ready for the season. If you're a baseball fan, just like the athletes take their physicals before they go play, go to the doctor. That's your time uh, that year. If you're a football fan, the exact same thing. Most importantly, climb your family tree. Talk to the people in your family that were your first doctors, your mom, your grandma, the, the people when you when I caught the flu as a resident, I didn't call my attending. I didn't look in a book. I called my mom. And if she didn't, she didn't make me feel any better, I called my grandma. I told my I said, she don't know what she's doing. The important thing is recognizing the gifts, the natural gifts of things uh, that you have uh, at your disposal. Uh, get fit is eating healthy. It's really, really simple. Healthy foods are the ones that spoil, and they're really simple. I, 
common response. I go, I, whoever will listen, uh, when, I, when I give lectures, I'm like, so what's the main ingredient in an apple? And everyone goes, well, it could be carbohydrates and it could be, a, you should know, apple. What's the main ingredient in chicken? Chicken. What's the main ingredient? Orange. Simple foods. Simplify your life. And then finally, I tell people to get moving. When you go to the doctor, you should know have be your own expert and master of those three things. The best exercise is the one you're going to do. Played football in college, and I hated lifting weights, and I still hate lifting weights. I don't like going to a gym. So if you say that is going to make me live till I'm 110, well, I guess I guess I won't make it because I'm just not doing it. I like to run. I like to walk. I like to do the find something that you like to do and do it, not just for your physical health. But for your mental health, like Dr. Morton was bringing up earlier, I mean, I talked about the EDSO, endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, to be a master, to have balance in your body. And we're all creative, so we might have a little bit more dopamine, and we might need a little help uh, balancing things out. But the EDSO, balancing, managing your EDSO, I tell them, manage your own mess. And if you can manage your EDSO and manage your mess, you'll be healthy, and you can have your doctor check up at least once a year to make sure you're healthy. And it turns into more of a dialogue than it does a lecture. In the sender message receiver equation, it, a lot of times it gets confused. It's not the healthcare provider that is the sender and the message that the receiver is the receiver, is their job is to receive. There's a feedback arrow that goes in that. The whole purpose of the interaction is for both of you to come to a mutual agreement on the message and walk away and to learn from each other. So that's the empowerment. And then I tell people that once I've given you this, your job is to give it away. Mm. That's yeah. Excellent. I'm wondering if everybody um, might chime in on a, on a thought. Um, I find myself a lot, having been a college professor for so long, talking to students of the past and, and, and currently about their COVID-15, because it's kind of a joke. Everybody's joking about it. But I've tried to um, inform them, like, that's cortisol, which is stress hormone. You know, like we're all, like part of it's, yes, you're at home and we're eating everything, but there's a reason. Can you guys um, talk a little bit about how that, um, stress factor, the mental stress can sh show up on the body and how that's something to pay attention to for blood pressure and everything that can come from that, that it's not just 15 pounds. It's, it's a sign. So, so, so if I can start and just lay the quick platform, uh, the, the reason I, I, part of what I do is I take the complicated stuff that we learn and I try to translate it to literally the level of an eight-year-old. And the reason I say an eight-year-old is because when I went to med school, my sister was eight years old, and when I'd call home and ask what she did for school, and she would tell me about her long division, which is the times and pluses and all that, she'd ask me about what I learned. I'd say the Krebs cycle, and every time, well, what's that? Well, it's when the body breaks, what's that? What's that? So I tend to try to break things down simple to lay the baseline. Um, cortisol, basically what, what happens when your body is stressed, you have two dominating hormones, you swim in stress soup, right? Cortisol and epinephrine. Cortisol regulates your blood sugar, Epinephrine raises, raises your blood pressure. Now, linked with the sugar is insulin. Cortisol can cause you to be what's insulin resistant, meaning that the insulin doesn't do its job, meaning open the door for, this, for the sugar to get out of the bloodstream and go into the cells. As excess sugar builds up, it turns into fat. It's not healthy to swim in stress soup, even though we're, we're all suffering from chronic stress during this COVID times because we're swimming with an epinephrine and cortisol, high blood pressure, high, high blood pressures, higher sugars, and you're so kind to say COVID-15. When you reach your 50s, it might turn into a COVID-40. Hmm. The point is that you need to get it off and walk it off, get checked, get fit, get moving. And I'm, I'm sure the, our, our other, my colleagues can take it a lot deeper. Anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, I'll, I'll be very happy to just talk about um, the physiologic effects of just stress, but from a sleep perspective because I did treat a lot of patients with sleep disorders and um, a lot of it was related to sleep disorder breathing you know from their throat but part of our approach to the patient was you know stress and stress can play a major part on your sleep cycle and Jenny would know this um, being that she does uh, you know rehab medicine but um Basically, it's during REM sleep that our body produces um, our growth hormone, which is a restorative hormone. It's during REM sleep that basically we restore our body in terms of mental health and, and also phys physiologic. And so just talking about 
cortisol in general, you know, Dr. Gribbs already talked about it can elevate your blood pressure, blood sugar, heart rate, et cetera, peripheral vascular resistance. The lack of sleep that is associated with anxiety and stress will have an adverse effect on your sleep and your overall restorative process, both physiologic and mental. And I think it's really important that if artists and people in general are experiencing a lot of stress from COVID, a lack of work, a lack of social interaction, it's really imperative that they have that addressed because that will create a cycle of really non-restorative function in the human body and then depression, et cetera. So all very much tied in cortisol and REM sleep, et cetera. Well done. Go ahead, yeah, and I, I'd, I'd love to put in the sort of digestive piece of this because so many artists I work with have digestive problems and this is so intrinsically linked to stress and a lot of people don't connect the mm -hmm. dots. Um, but when we're in a stress state in that cortisol or adrenaline dominant state, digestion gets switched off because it, it takes again, a lot of our battery life to run. And so if we're in defense mode, we're going to send those resources to other areas of the body and digestion gets shut down. So if people are eating, you know, a lot of people will come to me and say, I've got digestive problems, but I, you know, I've got the best diet. It's all organic and I don't eat this and I don't eat that, but I still have digestive problems. And I always say, it's not just what you eat. Of course, that is important, but it's the emotional context in which you eat. Because if you are eating in that stressed state, and for me, that's just like, don't have the news on while you're while you're eating don't check your emails while you're eating because if you go into that that stress state and it doesn't have to be full-on panic but just that sort of slightly elevated state your digestive system switches off so anything you're putting in is sitting and fermenting and then i say it's just becoming very expensive gut compost at that point right it's going to ferment it's going to release gases cause bloating distension and increase inflammation and we know that gut inflammation drives anxiety, right? It's a, it's a loop, the gut brain axis, we call it. So anything that's going on in the gut, all disease begins in the gut, as they say, but all health begins in the gut as well. But it's not just about addressing what you are eating, but you've got to get yourself into this relaxed state before you eat so, so that you are ready to receive. You know, if you're stressed, you're pushing everything away. So just having, just doing some breath work, I say to people as you're preparing your food, do your breathing work, be in gratitude for the ingredients you're preparing, sit down before you shove, shove the fork to the face, let the body just come into a state of rest, take a deep breath, be in gratitude, gratitude opens everything up in the body, right? Uh, so paying attention to that is not only good because it's going to reduce your stress at that point, but it's also going to reduce this tendency for the gut to then trigger the stress response as well. Got to cut the loop. <laughs> Great. I'm going to jump in, Dr. Diaz, if that's okay. I know we're just, uh, we're we're going to run out of time. Run out here. of time. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just do a, a quick round and check in with each of you. If you, um, you know, like Dr. Loeza, Dr. Griggs, if you had one one thing you would like to say to, to, to your patients or how we can be better patients, what we can do to either um, take ownership of our health or be prepared when we come into a, a doctor's visit, um, what would we do there? And then, um, you know, Jenny and Dr. Ramirez, you know, that same concept, what can we do to take ownership? One or two things that we can put into practice today um, to make our, our, our brains, our creative mind, our body, our gut, our stomach, all of it, our sleep, um, even better. Whoever wants to go first, jump in. So I'll just, let me knock it out. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the first thing, of course, I want everyone to, to breathe, check, and step back. Uh, before we go to the doctor, even the thought of going to the doctor, even as a doctor, it raises my anxiety level and that's my cortisol kicks in. The other thing is cortisol, just to be quite frank, is the stupid hormone. Cortisol makes you, it simplifies everything. That's the, cortisol is a hormone that makes you in the middle of class, if you're called unexpectedly, forget your name. Uh, 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 uh. 
So I want everyone to breathe, check, and step back. Take deep breaths. Understand it, that everything is going to be fine. Uh, check. Just do a, a, a check of yourself. Make sure to check off a list of all the questions that you want to ask the doctor and feel comfortable because you are the expert on you. And then take a step back. You know, before you do anything to be best prepared, it's always best to take a step back before you take a step forward. Uh, I, I like to tell uh, people to, to set your alarm 10 minutes early uh, before you wake up so you don't just fall into your day. You can just, particularly on Monday, right? Uh, wake up so you can do things on your own at your own pace. And then when you get to the doctor, have those three things in mind. Have the things that you want to, to talk about. Get checked. What do I want checked out besides a checkup? Get fit. Doc, is there anything food-wise I can do uh, when I leave here to empower myself? Like she said, like uh, Jenny said, health begins in the gut. Uh, what can I do to, to help myself? And then are there any exercises? Is there anything that I can do for myself? Because the more empowered, uh, we're taskmasters and we like the dopamine of accomplishing things. So is there anything that I need to do uh, to take control of my health uh, before I leave? And what that does is it gives you control of the conversation because now you're asking the doctor uh, to, to work for you. Great, who's next? Dr. Ramirez, why don't you go? Um, you know, I to make the better to make the patient a better patient. Um, that's really an open-ended question. There are social economic factors that are involved. I've worked with the poorest of the poor, and um, they are indebted for the health that we provide to them. And then I've worked with patients that are you know very well educated, and they're really up on their stuff. Um, so. You know, really, I, I ask patients to take care of their mind, their body, and their soul, and they really need to take ownership of their health um, when they're able to. And like I said, a lot of it is social economic restraints. Some patients that are working two jobs that don't have time to go to the gym, they're patients that can't.